started. Perfect. All right, we're all ready. Everything's good. We are good. Perfect. I think this is officially the yeah. like introduction. Oh yes, that's right. Oh, is Hello. there? Sorry, is there an introduction to my script? I closed my script, Roseanne. I just sent you a new one. I just sent you a new one. Just to oh, say. Oh well, I was too busy dancing. I didn't see it. I'm so sorry, Nicole. Let me be proper and introduce you and welcome you correctly. Of course, like now my computer's not responding. Great. Good evening and welcome to tonight's study session. We're excited to have an opportunity to engage with staff to learn about a very timely topic. Um, we are going to learn about the climate change and climate justice curriculum. Um, Superintendent Guerrero, would you please begin tonight's session? Very happy to, Chair Lowry, uh, for this school year. Uh, I know we've had this conversation with, with directors. We thought um, we'd want to focus on an opportunity to make sure our directors gain a deeper understanding of school district's work and priorities in, in a bit more informal and interactive format, uh, especially with various staff who maybe you don't hear from all the time, uh, who are leading and you know doing some really uh, awesome work uh, in, in some of these initiatives. So. We wanted uh, this experience of study sessions to be a little different from a typical regular meeting agenda item. Uh, we hope to provide you a little bit of a learning experience uh, that, that hopefully mirrors a little bit of, of the student learning experience. So uh, our goal is for directors uh, at the end of these sessions to be more knowledgeable about um, the strands of work that we've laid out in a learning syllabus for the year. Uh, and learn about their direct connection to uh, the comprehensive educational program that we want to provide our students. So uh, as educators, uh, we're excited to essentially have you as our learners, our students for the evening. Uh, so lead off batter tonight's uh, uh, first uh, study session agenda topic is climate change and climate justice um, curriculum. Um, I'm really happy to introduce Nicole Berg, uh, if you recall. Uh, Nicole joined Portland Public Schools as our climate change and climate justice programs manager and uh, the ever talented Nicole Berg will be leading tonight's topic and uh, so I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you so much. Um, good evening, Superintendent Guerrero, Board Chair Lowry, Directors and Student Representative Shu, and thank you for inviting me to share our team's work in moving climate change and climate justice curriculum forward in PPS. Um, I have taught online before and I've taught in person and um, I've taught adults and I've taught all different kinds of times of day, but I'm pretty sure this is the latest class I've ever taught. So, so let's all bear with me and uh, hopefully we'll keep it moving so you're engaged. Um, that's my job. <laughs> so tonight, um, here we click on that. One second. There we go. Tonight, you'll have the opportunity to review our progress thus far in integrating climate change and climate justice into our core K-12 curriculum and experience a sample lesson from our newly created climate change and climate justice high school elective set to be piloted in six PPS high schools this year. So feel free to ask questions along the way or at the end of our time together. Let's begin with a reminder of how far we've come since 2016 when dedicated climate educators and youth activists brought resolution 5272 to you, the PPS Board of Education for approval. In 2019, you reaffirmed your commitment to supporting this work by dedicating funds to create an innovative role, the Climate Change and Climate Justice Programs Manager, who would be responsible for accelerating and scaling the curriculum integration K-12 across the district and supporting the development of a climate justice youth advisory. As the person who currently serves in this capacity, I'm excited to report that this move has positioned our district to become a national leader in the area of education. And as Superintendent Guerrero said in his welcome back message, we're just getting started. And as you know, I moved here from the Midwest and introduced myself to you all on my first official day of work almost one year ago to the day. Um, having lived this past year in the Pacific Northwest, experiencing both a global pandemic and unprecedented and catastrophic wildfires, um, I have an even deeper appreciation and understanding um, for the rationale for climate justice education and activism that our community has named as central to our district vision in PPS Reimagined. 
having also um, been part of our collective experience in bearing witness to the national reckoning regarding racial justice, I intend to continue to do my part to contribute to justice for Black, Indigenous, and people of color who for generations have suffered the brutality of racism. I enter this space tonight as a representative of the collective work um, of our educators and students this summer who are reaffirming our commitment to our PPS core value of racial equity and social justice. And through our work together, we aim to disrupt systems of oppression and bring equity to our schools. Of the many characteristics named in our graduate vision for our nearly 50,000 PPS students, the one that most closely guided our curriculum development this summer is informed and influential global stewards. Through the development of our curriculum, we hope that students will see themselves as global change agents who are responsible stewards of the environment and knowledgeable about climate justice issues. Our goal is to support their ability to think critically about important topics and consider the impact that their decisions have on those around them so that they can lead the way in creating a healthy and sustainable world for all. So to create the kinds of learning opportunities that would offer students core knowledge in climate science and engineering solutions, as well as critical orientations to racial equity and social justice, our student and educator teams this summer developed a course anchored in project-based learning and inquiry. This is the overview of our new climate change and climate justice high school elective. And as you can see, the course is comprised of five units um, plus a launch unit. Um, four of the core units offer students the opportunity to engage in mini research projects related to case studies or other topics within each unit theme. Uh, for their final project, students will select an area of interest related to climate change and climate justice, develop their own project, and have the opportunity to share their learning with an authentic audience um, selected by the students and the teachers in their course. An added benefit of this course is that it's anchored in sufficient next generation science standards to yield 0.5 credit recovery for students in science who choose this option. This brings a level of system systematic equity to our schools by opening up the course to more students. And while we won't have time to watch um, the entire video, um, I did interview some students and captured their what they had to say in this video. Uh, I'll push play, hopefully bandwidth works, technology is our friend, and it should end at a minute. So I think I've got it timed for it, for it to kind of end itself. We'd love to hear what your experience was like. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Experience wise, it felt great to be working as students and teachers on the same product, on the same project, because like we are in the end, the, the two groups that will be using product the most at the end, like the, the whole course design and everything. It's all based on what we want. And so our voice is being in like impacting the design of the course as a whole. Well, it just felt great because I'm sure that it will lead to a better experience for both the end user groups at the end of the year. Yeah, um, it was super fun, but also weird because I've never done anything even anywhere near like this. Um, but, you know, we kind of got this like inside peek on what actually teachers do behind the scenes. Um, and also sort of felt like our voices were listened to in creating a class for our peers. It was a lot of fun. Um, like I learned how to design curriculum. That's something that most students don't know how to do. Um, it was great. It was great, like the learning experience and great knowing that we created this awesome class. Perfect. So in addition to video and uh, interview footage, we also collected daily feedback from participants to help keep pace and moderate the Institute along the way. What you're reading here is um, end of Institute feedback from both students and educators. Um, and this is what they kind of this is what they had to say about their experience um, by the last day of the institute. So as you can see, the experience led to some transformative thinking and enthusiasm to see more type of like more kinds of this work roll out in our district. All right, are you ready to experience a sample lesson from the course? <laughs> so just a reminder, this is hot off the press. 
you are the first like students uh, to participate in this lesson. So we'll work through whatever hiccups might come up. Um, but really throughout this lesson, uh, I invite you to consider how does this course support our district vision of cultivating informed and influential global stewards, as well as our core system shift of transformative curriculum pedagogy. So at this point, you should all have your materials. They were linked in board docs. There is a the sheet of the student student reflection sheet that will have um, the slides paste out. So if you get lost in the slides, you can refer back to your sheet. Unfortunately, you can't make notes in your sheet, but um, you'll be able to link to the important information there. Um, this is adapted um, from from a resource online. And you can always refer back to that website. The poem is on that website. But we'll be referring to this poem, um, both like listening and seeing. We're going to be reading this poem, digesting it, talking about it. And so uh, mainly the access to the poem is the most important part. But this lesson is entitled Rise, Understanding the Impact of Climate Change Through Science and Storytelling. And it's adapted from the poetry of Kathy Jetno Kitchener and Aka Nubiana. The lesson's divided into two parts. Uh, for today, we are only going to focus on part one, um, the ethnic studies and English language arts standards, and know that it builds towards integration of next generation science standards in subsequent lessons. Um, and so I've addressed the standards below, but let's go ahead and have three folks read the learning targets. <laughs> I'll read the first one. I can analyze the different perspectives represented by the two speakers of the poem. Thank you. I'll read the second. I can determine the meaning of words and phrases as they're used in this poem, including figurative and connotative meanings. Through the third, I can investigate past and present events where nation, national global interests are in conflict. That's awesome, thank you. And this slide shows you what we're building toward. Um, take a look at the ethnic studies and the next generation science standards um, and the learning targets for future lessons. So think about how these all fit together as we go through this. And for distance teaching and learning, we use a variety of digital instructional tools to transform digital spaces into classrooms. So as we get started, like I said, please make sure you have your worksheet available. Um, everything's linked in there and um, the next layer of technology would be using a Jamboard, um, but if that's if that's not coming up on your computers for you, that is totally fine. We will. I'll just show you all how it works and how students would use it in a classroom. But let's start with um, one thing we would do in a traditional classroom if we're kicking off a lesson is just get a sense of what our students know and what they wonder about, um, so that as a formative as formative data, I as a teacher kind of have a sense of where students are coming into the into the lesson in terms of their background knowledge or their experience, um, possible misconceptions. So what you know about the topic may or may not be factually accurate or may or may not be supported by um, academic studies, but it's what you know. And so let's think about what do you all know about the impacts of climate change, thinking uh, locally, nationally and globally. If we were to use the Jamboard, if you have the technology to do so, I'll show you what that looks like. And it's essentially a sticky note board. So you would go to the sticky note. You could pick your own color, type in here, hi, save it, and put it where you want. So I know this, right? You can also just think about what you know. And we can pop corn out. And uh, in a digital classroom um, in PPS, we could also use a chat feature. So students could have multiple different ways of sharing their knowledge with their peers. Okay, so for those of you who have not put anything in the Jamboard, let's start with what you know. Let's see. Who's responsible for the yellow post-its? All right. Then Director, let's see, Director Scott, might you share something that you know about the impact of climate change locally, nationally, or globally? 
Well, uh, yeah, thanks for calling on me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm going to start yeah, cold and, calling too. <laughs> no, I love it. I know, I know that some of the, uh, the, uh, the extreme weather events with the east wind and the fires um, last week and the dry weather um, were most likely caused by climate change. So that's a local, local issue. Great, great. Let's see, who's E? Um, can I see? I'm trying to think. Who else has not put a post-it in? So I, I'm E and it's Ailey Nicole. It's my first name is Funky. So Got it. Okay. So that's, I'm the three yellow ones. There's another yellow one. That's not me, but I was really fascinated by the zombie hurricane because that's just so 2020. That was absolutely fascinating. How about one more? I screwed up and did the other yellow one about the uh, methane relate release from the Arctic being uh faster than expected. Shocking, shocking. Yeah, absolutely. We can do the same thing in the same presentation then with what do you wonder? So what are some things that you're wondering about in terms of the impacts of climate change? Nicole? Yes. This is Michelle, or otherwise known as Director of the Past, but I prefer Michelle. Okay. I'm not sure how to interact with Jamboard. If I need to open another window, or I love that there's sticky. I love that there's an app for the sticky uh, sticky wall, but I don't know how to interact with it. Do you have your student worksheet? I do. The link is in your student worksheet. Okay. It should say Jamboard. I'll show you the student worksheet really quickly. Let's see, the curriculum num, materials. Yeah, I think I have it right here. It's in a PDF. Yep, and the, so you won't be able to put notes in there, but you'll be able to link from there. So the KWL Jamboard activity, which is in the first two cells of the table, once you get past uh -huh. the description, that will take you right to the Jamboard. Still looking. Are you on slide 14, Michelle? I'm not even, oh, it's, I wasn't in the PowerPoint. That was, I think, part of the problem. Oh, <laughs> you have to go to the there PowerPoint. Too. That's right. <laughs> slide 14, and, and then just. My, my computer's, it's probably not the computer, it's probably me, but yeah, it's it's not loading real quickly here. No worries, this, and this is so real. This is exactly what is happening in our classrooms. Here so as a teacher, you have to think through about five or six different ways and methods for students to stay engaged when one thing doesn't work and maybe it works for some, but it's not working for others. So this is just exactly the experience we want everybody to have is, is understanding what it feels like to be a student in this in this type of environment. So that's so real and so <laughs> important. And yes, I'm finally here for the Jamboard activity. Thank you for your patience. I think, I mean, any opportunity to learn is a great opportunity. And maybe this would be a great tool to use, you know, in, in distance collaboration, just even as a board or in any other way, because this is um, this is kind of helpful with visioning and just kind of getting ideas out in a different format. So what are we all wondering? Vice Chair Bailey, what might you wonder? Have we heard from you yet? I, I can't see. I have these disembodied voices half the time. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm, I just put up, uh, I wonder um, how many people are going to move here as particularly the Southwest runs out of water uh, when the Oglala Aquifer finally uh, <laughs> runs out, mm -hmm. um, when the Colorado River dries up, all those, all those things. Yeah. We, we saw Las Vegas with a huge water shortage a couple of years ago that's only going to get worse. Right. Yeah, and I'm seeing people posting about what are the chances of humanity becoming extinct? Will science save us?
Perfect. Wait, can other people move your sticky posts or? They might be able to. I haven't, I didn't do any special like settings on this. I just moved someone's and yes. Yes, I think yes. we can move them around, yeah. So if we were gonna sort them in like thematically or mm -hmm. numerically or something, we could do that. Yep, exactly. What do we know about the impacts of climate change? <clears throat> And so then as an educator in a classroom, I could look around, we could generate an infinite amount of questions from students. This can actually then guide our curriculum development at, at like in the in time lesson development piece. Like we already know the landscape. We know exactly kind of where we're trying to go. But now that we're seeing what students questions are, we can just integrate that into our lessons for future reference. So maybe these, these will come up today or maybe these wonderings are things that we wanna keep at the forefront and make sure that we address all of students' questions throughout the, throughout the lessons. And where maybe I don't have a specific lesson that will address students' questions, maybe that's where we do a mini research project or we investigate something together and um, build the knowledge together. So this, is, this tool is actually very useful for a lot of different purposes. And Nicole, did I hear you say, so, I mean, part of this in an online environment in particular is that giving students, so hopefully students have access to everything, they can post their own stickies, but even if they don't, maybe they have access to the chat or maybe they just say something and then you could write it on a sticky. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Or they, or if they choose to say silent, they can document their thinking in their student journal and that student journal can be shared with me later on, or it can be an in-time journal that I keep up because it's a Google, when it's a Google doc. I can see all the edits that are being made, you know, in real time. So I can keep an eye on even the the silent, the, the quiet students that are less likely to speak up in a large group. You can use these questions as a springboard for group projects or uh, class projects or individual projects. And again, this kind of student centered, here's the question I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then you can, you know, the first law of ecology is everything is connected to everything else. So you, you get two different student projects uh, or presentations and you can go, okay, class, how are these two connected? Um, and and that just makes it, makes it that much richer. Yes, yep, exactly. And so we'll shift now um, that we've kind of done some formative assessing um, and getting everybody's voices into the room in some way. Um, I'll set up this next, this next part is that we're actually going to be learning um, from two poets from two different parts of the world about um, the impacts of climate change on their homelands. So Kathy Gentno Kitchener is a world renowned poet and climate activist from the Marshall Islands and Akaniviana is an Inuk artist and activist from Greenland. Their bios are here. Um, again, this all has been has been adapted from that original website um, that's linked at the top of um, the document, the, the student note sheet document and in the slides. And so um, you can refer back to that um, for more information. But we're really only gonna have time to dip our toes into the water. Um, so I'd like to set up this video. So part of, I'm a bilingual educator by, by trade. So um, one of the things I like to always do is create um, a universally or as, as universally as possible accessible um, uh, learning experience for all the students and then scaffold up from there. Um, so we usually start with um, speaking and listening and visual supports are excellent to help with that. So again, this video is a five and a half minute video, but we'll only dip our toes into like the first minute. So you can see how the two poets and the visual representation set up the poem. So it helps you understand the, the written poem even better. Um, so I will start here. Sister of ice and snow, I'm coming to you from the land of my ancestors, from atolls, sunken volcanoes, undersea descent of sleeping giants. Sister of ocean and sand, I welcome you to the land of my ancestors, to the land where they sacrificed their lives to make mine possible, to the land of survivors. I'm coming to you from the land my ancestors chose, Nayangkina, Marshall Islands, a country more sea than land. I welcome you to Kadesh Yipnunan, Greenland, the biggest island on earth. 
So we'll pause there. Um, our guiding question is really, what did we learn from Kathy Jetno Kitchener about the impact of climate change and other environmental threats to life in the Marshall Islands? And then what did we learn from Akinibiana about the impact of climate change and other environmental threats to life in Greenland? And so I'll give you a few moments to, um, is everybody able to access the written poem? It should be linked in your, it's linked in your um, student worksheet. So rather than watching the whole video, I'll give you time to read the poem really quickly with these guiding questions in mind. So think through like, what's something we're learning from um, about the Marshall Islands and what's one thing we're learning about Greenland in terms of threats. I'm happy to cold call or I'm happy to have people popcorn out as long as we're mindful of sharing space. So if there's someone who has not shared yet, let's start there. Wants to speak up. <laughs> I'll talk. Yeah, I'm, um, the, the reference to nuclear waste. Sure. Um, and and it, was, uh, it was interesting because uh, I think many of us are familiar with, you know, we tested all the nuclear bombs in the Pacific, but the, this one also had ice, <laughs> an ice reference to it, I believe. Uh, and now you've got me, I'm trying to flip back and forth. Um, first through wars inflicted on us, then through nuclear waste dumped in our waters on our ice. And now this, that, that gives it a historical perspective of, you know, this isn't the only thing um, that's happened to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Inflict, been been inflicted on us. Yep, and there'll be opportunities later on in the lesson to kind of dig deeper into that historical perspective. Yeah. Colonizing monsters mm -hmm. pops up a couple of stanzas down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What else did we learn from one of the poets? <clears throat> I just I love the reference to the um, place like the place based. Um, the, just the references like ocean and sand shells shores the atoll bikini atolls specifically and I read it really quickly but I'm just like really loving the language um, and how she's describing her experience in the landscape. Um, that would be for the, for Kathy, uh, is it Jutnil Kitchener? Mm -hmm. That's, so that's kind of a perfect segue to the next slide, but I want to make sure we don't have other people that want to share learning about the impact. I got to say too, this is, 
my work right now at my day job is trying to um, frame the idea of sustainability away from this like environmentalist, like white centric, you know, like the polar bear, like floating on a little ice flow to understanding like the impact of, you know, rising seas and on, on frontline communities um, and, and those places that are disappearing. Um, and so this is just, this is so amazing. Do you, do you know either of these people? Um, I did meet Kathy Jetno Kitchener. She was here at PSU this last fall, um, doing a poetry reading and, and a lesson, and, you know, basically teaching, you know, using her poetry to teach us. And so I was fortunate to have met her there, but I know that she has deep ties to um, Portland. And I definitely know that, you know, our, um, our Pacific Islander students, um, you know, we have, we have many, many people who call the Marshall Islands home or ancestral homelands. And so um, this is very relevant and, and important for all of our students to learn about because it's important for them to understand, you know, um, where peer, their peers are coming from or what's happening, you know, in communities maybe that um, if you've been living only in Portland or only, you know, in Wisconsin, yeah. for example, we wouldn't necessarily know about these perspectives. I, um, so Marshallese is one of the languages that the city of Portland, when it comes down to the, like the, the top five, you know, um, safe harbor languages, but Marshallese is, some of the bureaus translate into Marshallese. And then it's one of those languages that's like, only the royalty speaks the, the knows the written language, you know, and versus verbal. And anyway, there, we do have a lot of, um, we do have a lot of people, uh, Micronesian, uh, Marshallese from the islands there in Portland. Yeah, and actually in the bio on um, on the website, Kathy Jetno Kitchener does talk about how she was looking for legends um, written in her in Marshallese, and um, so she was trying to figure out which legend would really fit nicely with this poem. As uh, as you see, they, the the two poets talk about legends, and so thinking about the importance of, and we can go you know deeper, superficial, but you know the the importance of language as culture and um, the importance of maintaining and supporting students in retaining heritage language or learning heritage language um, and really honoring that and celebrating that. And so whatever we can do in our schools to, um, to contribute to that as well, I think is so important. It's amazing. And so speaking of language, <laughs> um, Actually, student representative Shu, I would love to bring you into this conversation because it's been a while since I've been in a formal English teaching classroom. Um, and so I want to make sure I have my definitions of figurative and connotative set. How do they look? <laughs> uh, pop quiz. <laughs> Ooh. Um, I'm sorry, where do I find those? Um, and we're on slide. Uh, what slide is this? This is a uh, 19. Slide 19, which I get to by pressing what? Can you see the screen? Oh, I'm sharing back the screen. On the, okay, I see that. Okay. Uh, so figurative language being things like similes and metaphors, like when you're trying to describe something but not using the literal words for it. So an example yeah. in the poem would be like atolls are, and sunken volcanoes are like the literal language, but she refers to them as sleeping giants. Yeah. How about the connotative language? So like you use a word to evoke a certain emotion or cultural association and a meaning, but there's like this hidden meaning. So you could choose to say I'm stuck or you could say I'm rooted and each of those have different connotations. Like rooted makes it seem more like ancestry and trees and life. Stuck would be more like kind of a negative connotation. Am I good? I mean, I think so. Frankly, okay. I haven't covered <laughs> anything like this since like middle school oh no our high school english classes really don't have that kind of focus so well this kind of language stuff is in the standards we gotta make sure we're revisiting these things i think nathaniel just raised a, a point that the board needs to take up so. <laughs> i really appreciate your perspective <laughs> i love it so thinking back on the poem like we could dissect it again. So we would have students review the poem. So they're getting even more information that they're gleaning from the poem, um, both in terms of content knowledge, like understanding. And then also there's this layer of 
um, English language arts that goes into it. So let's talk about what you're seeing in the poem in terms of either figurative language or connotative language. And knowing that poets or anyone using language arts for a purpose um, is very intentional about um, the use of language to, to deliver a message. And so thinking about what each of the poet's messages are, how does this use of language support that message or add to add a layer of understanding? Who have I missed so far? How about how about uh, Nathaniel? Yeah, what what are you thinking? Uh, for either of them. Yep, you pick. You pick. Hmm. Let's see. I don't know. Well, here's, I suppose, a candidate. Um, quote, we have years, we have months. This is at the end of um, page five, I think. Um, before you watch from your TV and computer screens waiting to see if we will still be breathing. And now I misread that. Okay, never mind. <laughs> um, I thought it said something else. Let's see if I maybe just move on to someone else while I find okay. something decent. <laughs> Have we heard from Director Brim Edwards or Director Constan? I, I actually think this poem is not very figurative. It's pretty literal. Um, but um, there are, you know, there, there's a reference to the, um, I'm not looking at it right here, but the 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 glaciers are your children, the seas are her children. But generally, I think it's pretty literal. Mm -hmm. I've noticed there's a lot of like kind of connotative language. So the, the word selection kind of evoked a certain emotion or an association. Absolutely. Even the phrase to see if, to see if we're still breathing, you know, that's in, you know, in some ways literal, but not, I, I don't think they mean that literally, but if you're talking about the Marshall Islands being completely underwater, um, in a sense, you're talking about a whole nation, uh, a whole way of life, not breathing anymore. Yeah. And so in the interest of time, I'll just keep us moving. But um, to show you one more tool that then we could also use to have students to kind of dissect and understand even more um, the messages in this poem. So this links to an actual Google Earth presentation that I created to support this lesson. So what students could do is we could reread the poem again. And what I've done here is I've linked all of the different locations that are named in the poem. I've created links for them on this globe. And as they come up in the poem, we can have Google Earth take us there and we can really do some exploring. And so this can go as deep or as surface as we want it to go. But I just wanted to show you how this works. So, you know, there's Bikini Atoll, um, there's Marshall Islands, Runet Dome is, is mentioned. I can move forward in the slides and it'll transport me to Greenland. And so what's wonderful about this tool is that it can take students on virtual field trips around the world, you know, so you can like zoom in and you can see things, whatever they have available here for us to look at. Um, and so we can really kind of get in and go, what is it like there? What, you know, let's explore the town or let's explore the, the area. Um, so I wanted to give you a sense of this as a tool because it's just a really excellent tool. <laughs> have to show me how to do that linking with slides that is incredible <laughs> neat i just was like in love with this they've really done some incredible updates to google earth so i'm not teaching this past year but i've been teaching economic geography most of the last 10 years and 
I give my students at community college, I give them map quizzes, um, just more as a fun thing, you know, and they love them. Uh, it's like, wait, you don't have another one for us today? <laughs> and, and it's a lot of it's just naming countries for the 10 largest countries or the Fertile Crescent where civilization, quote unquote, started. Right. Um, but, um, you know, we're so closed in on our world and that's just another another way of getting them out out there but wow linking with with google earth and that focus is great this is pretty it, cool it looks like google earth has really um upped its game in the last couple of years since i've yeah. been on it it's amazing yeah and scott i didn't know you taught um economic is it economic geography yeah cool it's uh I, I turned it into why are there poor countries and rich countries? Um, I took a, an economics class this summer uh, called Economics of Emancipation. So economics oh of gosh. political economy through a, 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 a black liberation lens. That was a great class. Highly I don't know more about that class. I might want it to was, you would love it. It was like almost all 100% people of color presenting global citizens. Um, through UMass, I'll send you. I'll send you the info. Please, the, thank you. That'd be amazing. It would be a great professional development. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, Nicole. Um, yes. I'm curious. Um, well, I've got like two screens up here, a touch screen, and everything. How um, are you finding ha, students? So I'm assuming high school students are digital natives, but do they have? everything they need in order to be able to fully utilize all these capabilities? My understanding is yes, um, because this is, it's an educational digital tool that's in our toolbox connected to our um, Google, but I would need to double check that because I just used it with my stuff, so. Yeah, super cool. I just, I'm hoping our students have like all they need in order to be able to just right. uh, explore their world. Yeah, and you know, bandwidth is a is an issue. Connectivity is an issue, and so that's that's just like an ongoing challenge, as you all know. But um, yeah, to the extent that we can use this, and I'm gonna have to put in a shameless plug for the fact that Antarctica exists on this planet. I can't tell you how many classes I have been in in my life in my career where we don't talk about the polar regions. We don't talk about Antarctica very much. Like you don't even see it when you look at those maps on the, you know, and in a store or whatever, you know, some map you can decorate your wall with. I always go, where is Antarctica? This is a giant polar cap and we have no idea that it's, that it exists. So just even things like that to, to help dispel the, the myths that like pop culture puts out there or um, just sort of, you know, consumer culture puts out there. Um, There's actually a black man that takes uh, veterans and inner city kids to um, Antarctica every year. Where? Yeah, um, I'll put that in your email too. It's called Soul River. So he's okay. a fly fisherman that works on like, of course, global warming issues, but he's like an African-American man here in Portland. Does that, it every year. Okay. I'm trying to get on as a cook. Let, please, please, let, we, we need to connect us with that person because we're yeah. looking for all kinds of people that can work with our students in the class. And so, you know, if students are interested in investigating certain things, like let's make sure that they have access to people that can teach them firsthand. He's, he is amazing. You like, you wouldn't even believe it. That's awesome. So, Nicole, I, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm so sorry, uh, Director Scott. I was just going to add to Director DePaz's comment about the gentleman, the fly fisherman. Uh, I know about him as well. And one of the things that I think from a value standpoint is um, his expertise, who he works with, but also uh, his articulation of how difficult he has found it at times to participate in the outdoors as a person of color and how mm -hmm. unsafe he has felt. And so certainly we have students and families uh, who have felt that way. And so I would just second Director DePoss's, uh nomination for us uh, maybe learning more and reaching out to that gentleman. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's an important point. Um, I hate to bring politics in, but I'm, I'm sort of curious as we talk about this curriculum, how do you 
how are we training sort of teachers? How are we developing the curriculum to deal with a you know diversity of views on this? So so I can imagine on the one hand in the learning environment, right? Some of some of the best learning environments are where you get this free exchange of of differing viewpoints, and yet at the same time, I, I could I could imagine it would be very disruptive, right? Um, you know, to have someone who just says, well, the climate change doesn't exist. Like, why are we you know, why are we learning about this? It doesn't make sense. And we have those students, you know, in our, in our schools, in our district that believe that. How are we training teachers to address those situations? So um, I think that's where the, first of all, the launch unit is critical to this whole course, because in the launch unit is really where, and that's similar to our soft start, but a little bit more intentional about like building protocols and sort of exploring identities and thinking about um, how to, um, listen with empathy and how to respond with, you know, empathy or how to how to engage in topics that are difficult to talk about um, because they're politically contentious. And so that's part of the, the work that we would need to do, like in the particular in the Design Institute, um, we had a, our first full day was a lot of identity work and it was a lot of collaborative like norming. So making sure that we came to community agreements as, as to how we were gonna speak in spaces or how we were gonna um, be with each other in, in the space. Um, and then also um, more about unpacking our own identities and building a sense of community. And so that um, we tried to eliminate or mitigate any sort of um, us versus them kind of feelings because it's not really about us versus them. It's about this collaborative dialogue that we can engage in where we all take away something new or we can all learn um, and think critically about topics. And so in order to think critically about topics, it's important to have a wide range of ideas about a topic. Um, so kind of really being intentional with that launch unit. Um, I think then in subsequent teaching, if we when we do professional learning for other teachers that will take the course up, we'll do similar work. Um, and I think we'll need to learn also from this, the students and the educators that did the course this year that are teaching the course this year and take lessons learned and apply that to future professional learning as well. But it's, you know, racial equity, social justice kind of 101. Um, how do we how do we work um, in space together when we all have maybe very polarizing viewpoints about topics? Um, that can be a variety of things, but we, we get ahead of that by making sure that we feel connected to each other, um, learn how to listen to understand and not listen to respond. Also learn how to use multiple sources to kind of pull together information. So there's a lot of academic thinking that goes into it, but then also a lot of um, bringing down that affective filter we talk about that, you know, gets students kind of maybe, um, well, Zaretta Hammond talks about the amygdala hijack. So like if students are in a very tense situation, they might shut down or they might go to fight or flight. So how do we create warm and supportive environments where all students kind of feel a sense that they can they can explore ideas together um, that we'll learn from each other. It's great. Thank you. Yeah, sure no, I, that's great. Sat in on a seminar um, put on by the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis titled "How to Teach About Inequality uh, or Economic Inequality," and they really meant racial inequality, but they didn't even put that in the title. Um, and it was, I mean, it was, uh, they presented some really good resources and shared some good, good stories and strategies, but it was also painful to watch how timid they were yeah. <laughs> in talking about how to bring this up in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and this was, was, I think, aimed at high school, college, community college. Uh, a couple of the presenters were college professors. Um, and I appreciate that, you know, talking about protocols up front and how to have that respectful disagreement, you know, that's the baseline. And that wasn't even broached in this. Uh, yeah, so there's uh, awesome work <laughs> to, to the team. Yeah, the, it was incredible. They did, they did excellent work, yeah. Um, so again, in the interest of time, um, we would go back as a classroom, we would go back and talk about like, what do we actually learn once we've kind of digested all this information. Um, and this would be kind of considered our synchronous time together. Then I would launch you into asynchronous. So here's some stuff you can do on your own. You have this foundation knowledge. We've talked about things. We've digested a bunch of ideas. 
Um, now, this is pretty cool. Um, Google Earth has an actual, um, I don't know what they call it, like a presentation, I guess. That's all about sea level rise and the fate of coastal cities. And as you can see in the poem, she named multiple coastal cities. Uh, you know, uh, Rio, I believe, and she talks about um, Miami and New York and Amsterdam. And, um, and so students can go in and do their own research, their own investigation by touring these cities and learning um, about sea level rise and the impact on different cities. So that's something that they can work through in the afternoon. I get that it's screen time still, um, which is hard, but it's also, this is really in, important geographic information um, and it's real time. So that's, you know, yeah. it's useful. Um, and so then the idea would be for um, students to select a, and then like learn about that as, so, as some more information, but then select, you know, one of the locations that are named in the poem and let's dig deeper. So the nuclear testing, so the Bikini Atoll, right? And we can talk about what does it mean to have a bunch of nuclear waste buried under, under an island that is becoming engulfed by ocean and what's that going to mean for the rest of the world if the nuclear waste gets out and into the streams and that, so like there's lots of questions that can come up around that, for example. Um, hey, hey, Nicole. Yes. This is Amy. Can I just wanna pick up on something that you said, this is a little tangential, but um, um, when you're talking about asynchronous learning and um, screen time, you know, it occurred to me like, are we really asking our educators to think about project based learning specifically as an antidote to mm -hmm. the screen time environment that we're in right now? Like this class is a perfect example of thinking about, you know, what can you go out and do on your own that puts you you know, in the middle of even an urban forest or in a stream bed or whatever, but but all of our classes could have applications like that. And maybe we should be thinking about project learning, project based learning in that in that vein. It would be it's a it's an excellent framework for all kinds of work. And as well as, you know, in environmental studies, it's you don't want to protect something you don't understand. So like part of helping students care about our environment is helping students connect and, and become more familiar with our environment. So anytime students can spend outdoors, especially in pandemic, there's lots of places to go outdoors where you can be away from people, but you know, explore your area. So yes, absolutely. I'd love to see that built in. Um, this is somewhat tangential also, but I became aware of a, 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 um, a Portland parent that rented a farm or some land out on Soviet Island. Okay. That's one acre. So it's not a lot, but it's a, they have like a covered structure and they're inviting kids to come out and use this like learning lab. Wow. It's That's so incredible, neat. except, except it's not because it's not accessible. Right. Yeah. That's, <laughs> That's a really good idea. I mean, I wish the district could um, do something like that. Yeah, and I've spoken to a few different community partners that have talked a little bit about, you know, can we can we create something outside at one of our parks or one of, you know, at an, any of our yeah. areas in Portland and, you know, can we have different sites around the city where we could work with students. So I think all these conversations are, are F, you know, perfectly timed, you know, and even post pandemic, you know, mm -hmm. what does it look like to get kids out of buildings way more frequently than they're in them yeah. so that they're out exploring things. A lot of people in Portland working on low income kids in particular, and I, I volunteered for years, 10 years for an organization that's not around anymore, but um, literally picking up kids from apartment buildings and taking them mm -hmm. out to Mount Hood. Yeah, yep. And get them along the gorge and the Columbia River. Yeah, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And there's so much history and so much just, you know, history and geography tied together. So, yep. Speaking of coastal cities. Uh, Coos Bay, Tillamook, and Astoria, among others, are basically at sea level. Mm -hmm. um, so I can see in future years the possibility of teaming with high school students in those places to yeah. do some kind of joint exploration of uh, the topography <laughs> um, and the impacts. Um, and to help bridge this, you know, this sort of other Oregon 
them as urban rural right yep piece of what happens with climate change mm -hmm. you know, it's it's become so polarized if there's a way to depolarize that through this kind of an exchange yeah would be pretty cool and if there's one thing that the pand pandemic has done that's been really good is this idea of being able to connect across anywhere around the world to we're doing video chat so much so how do we even just get students connected you know classrooms connected through video chat even now to learn from each other meet each mm -hmm. other and talk about issues that matter to them mm -hmm. yeah absolutely are there other questions may i ask a question about your last slide about yeah. the six pps high schools yes is this going to be um, rolled out to every high school? And do you know the two high schools that's not? Is it Benson and Jefferson? Let's see. The ones that I know we do have it in um, is Alliance, Cleveland, Franklin, Grant, Wilson, and Madison. Um, and and so we'll pilot it this year. There's four, four of those six schools were actually involved in the designing of the course with the students and the teachers together. Um, and then the two other course, the two other schools um, came on after that. Um, I think there's just there's just a lot going on in terms of master schedules and allocations, and so and so it has this has implications for so many parts of our system that I was just excited to get it in six schools <laughs> right off the bat. Um, so I think yes, um, we will. It's absolutely it's it's a GVC structured course. It's in Atlas. We will build out in Canvas and also then um, continue to co-create and and refine and, and revise, but um, it'll be open to anyone to use. Yes. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah, sure thing. Can you um, say um, a little bit more, I, I, or maybe just repeat it? Um, you said that it's an elective, but that it can be used as a credit recovery for a science class. Can you say that again? Because you said it. Yeah. Quick yeah. So what we did in the design of the course is we intentionally bridged science standards and social studies standards with ideas around language arts and um, even math to, to a certain extent. But um, we made sure that we have embedded into the course enough science credit or enough science standards that are assessed and priority standards that it would yield 0.5 science credit recovery. So it would give students a half a, a, half a science credit recovery. Um, because we have, I think at minimum, we have about, we have, we have more than six science standards, but we have at least six assessed and priority science standards in this. And so eventually it'd be wonderful if we could work with the system in such a way that we could maybe build in enough social studies or ethnic studies standards that students could get credit recovery for that, or maybe English language arts standards. But, but for right now, we thought, okay, let's just start small so that we can have two options and see how that works and make sure that it, it works the way we intend it to. Um, but yeah, the idea is that it's completely standards based and so we can we can give credit recovery. We can give credit recovery, but it that wouldn't count as a, a like a regular science. Right, it's, it's not a core science course. They have far more standards in the physics and the chemistry and the biology. Um, mm -hmm. So directors, um, we're on the in closing slide, so it, it was important to make sure that you walk away with uh, a little bit of an elevator speech, hopefully after uh, a sample lesson. Uh, I know that uh, also shared with you was some other exemplar lessons at other grade levels and other topic areas. I hope that you have a chance uh, to peruse those, but um, more importantly, just to give you a little bit of a flavor about um, how to take a policy and materialize uh, the development of a curriculum that's inclusive with students um, and, and teachers and begin to roll out uh, and, and pilot this curriculum, not just at the high school level, but begin to expose students at every grade level. So they have at least one integrated unit. And I think as Nicole did masterfully, just kind of hinting at how you can really take uh, disciplines across content areas to really do, do that integration. And, and I saw uh, lots of you in, in your comments sort of make those uh, connections. And in the process of one lesson, I think directors got a chance to even try out some of the technology tools that our teachers are starting to integrate. So not just the tools and the platform, but some of the digital resources 
you know, to give you a sense of um, how those can be pulled in too. So even during distance learning, um, you know, how do we continue to stay on track with the content and the standards that, that we want to teach. So uh, it's really only possible when our educators make sense of it. Uh, tonight, you had a chance to learn from one of our rock stars in PPS. So uh, yeah. as we say, uh, uh, you know, an applause visually for Nicole Berg for, for being with us uh, this evening. Um, I'll be really interested uh, as we close up if you um, have any comments about whether this format for a study session that's structured more like a lesson plan, which I really enjoyed working with Nicole on, uh, mm -hmm. as we think about our monthly topics. If uh, I noticed folks were very engaged and, and it was informal and interactive, and, and if that's the kind of format uh, I know that Director Bailey and I talked about as an objective uh, for this time together, uh, we'd, we'd love to hear sort of your, your feedback um, before we dismiss class. I am so impressed and it's late because um, I'm an early bird, but um, Nicole, thank you so much and superintendent too for, for collaborating on this. This is, you know, history and it's environmental justice and it's like so many things in poetry and English and everything wrapped up. I just, I want to come back to class. <laughs> it was amazing. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I agree, and um, on your <clears throat> solicitation for feedback, Superintendent, um, I really enjoyed the opportunity to not only learn about the process here and some of the subject matter, but to have an experience like a student with the platforms, with the tools, I think is really helpful and fun. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I loved it. And no disrespect to anyone else who's done amazing presentations, but this was my favorite work session of my last year. Hey, gold star. Thank you. Thank you. This is a study session, not a work session. That's why it's different. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair enough, fair enough. This will be the new thing we'll be doing. Um, so the second meeting of every month, we will have a study session afterwards. And um, the syllabus, the learning, Guadalupe calls it the syllabus, I call it the learning plan. Um, you've seen that of the things we're going to cover over the months to try to really help us as board members have a robust sense of all the different things that are happening. And unfortunately, we couldn't get to Jonathan and community engagement tonight. They have a new framework and some new information for us. Um, so they'll be sharing that in a future meeting. Um, but I also really enjoyed this. Nicole, you are amazing. Um, oh, thank you. So thankful you're here with the district. and. Um, loved the poem and just all the different ways different kinds of learners could engage with the curriculum so i think that also shows just the robust curriculum development we have at pps thank you this i just want to say John, jonathan you've got your work cut out for you as uh following up this presentation <laughs> yeah i hope uh uh I, again, talking with our superintendent about how to make these sessions work. Um, okay, I'll just say better than some of the presentations we've had where we get an hour PowerPoint and three minutes of discussion. Uh, I know Director Brim Edwards, that's one of the points that you brought up and, and others as well. And to me, this really uh, was a, a great mixture of that participation discussion, as well as sharing information um, in, in a really, a really wonderful way. So awesome. Thank you. This is a great way to lead things off uh, again. So Jonathan, good luck. Thank you. Yeah, I was really excited about the format. This is new to me as well. Um, in my former district, I remember kind of like those presentations we have to present to the board to explain what's going on. And it always seemed like maybe they got half of what we were trying to say. And that's adult learning theory. You only get about half of what's said to you. So let's engage you in, in, as adults and learners. Um, uh, did you have some feedback to share about the study session? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I also think that this format is great. Um, I, I've never really seen anything like this, but it is it is great, um, and it's also fun to watch board members try to figure out Jamboard. Um, so, I hope we keep doing this. So please, please uh, delete the the PowerPoint that you received last week. We're going to start from scratch. Thank you for giving us 
another two weeks. <laughs> Nathaniel, what do you think about your peers in, in terms of like this kind of a lesson? Can I ask that? Do you think this would be an engaging way for students to learn? Or what do if you think? If it was actually executed like it was here, I think it could be, yes. But I mean, it's all in the execution. Sure, sure. Although, I mean, if current trends continue, I could foresee it like um, when you ask for questions, I could very easily see no one responding. You'd just be looking at a bunch of um, cameras that are turned off. Um, yeah. Sea of silence. So yeah. I don't know yeah. could run into those issues. I actually had a question. I don't know, Nicole, if you can answer this or somebody else, but like, so at one point I was like, oh my God, I hope I don't get called on. And like, you were circling me. Um, but it was like, I couldn't find something. And I'm just wondering like how students are. And then I got like off onto the world, the Google map. And um, I was still hoping I wasn't going to get called on because I was into something really interesting. But how are students like, if you can't find something or you're missing a link, how are students getting help? And I don't know if that's a question to fairness directed to you or somebody else, but it, that's just what I got a sense. It's like, oh, this is what happens virtually is like you have students in their individual homes and maybe you miss a step and then you're just off for the rest of the time. Yeah. I think there's a couple pieces to that. One, that's where the chat feature really comes in handy because then someone can chat a question and while the teacher is continuing to move, you can even set up maybe like you're the chat moderator and you're the this and you're the that, or you can moderate the chat as well and say, oh, um, and often I would be poppy, I would be populating the chat with the documents that students needed right in time as well, so they could have access to those links right away. So it's part of how you set up your classroom norms and routines. Um, and then also making sure that things are, yeah, accessible in multiple different ways. So everything's attached to your calendar invite and everything's in the chat and everything's in your, you know, your student worksheet. It's all linked there. So yeah, but you were also off task, but you were still learning. And so that's also cool. <laughs> you, were, you were getting into a rabbit hole. That's great. <laughs> well, and also like we can't use the chat because we're in a public right. meeting. So it's like good to know that that's a feature. And I mean, yeah. it just makes me think also about like which of our teachers are digital natives um, that this is just like second nature um and where what kind of pd just to because this seems super um accessible and engaging yeah sure yeah. lowry i just want to i'll end with um uh really appreciated the opportunity tonight to to cover this topic uh it is representative of so many uh, educators who, who dedicated time in the Curriculum Institute and have continued to stay engaged, uh, whether through the Climate Justice Committee or, or in other ways continue to advocate. And of course, uh, we wouldn't have been provoked to really giddy up with this work if it were for our students. So uh, here you have sort of a progress report of where we are with it. Um, I think this is unique and innovative work. I don't think you're going to find it in another school district. Um, I can only imagine where we're going to be by the end of the school year when this continues to roll out across all of our schools and, and all of our grade levels. All right, with that, I'm going to call us to um, the end of this session. Thank you everyone for your time tonight and for the great work that we were able to get done today. Um, we have agenda setting tomorrow morning at 11. So if you have any topics for agenda setting, please email those before 11 a.m. tomorrow as we won't receive them after that. Um, and I will be sending out my Wednesday weekly update to you with all we covered at agenda setting. All right, everyone have a great night and we'll see you in a couple of weeks if not before. <laughs>